Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Hello and welcome to this edition of the StoryCraft Cafe podcast. Boy, do we have some great announcements in the cafe this week that have happened. The launch of the 500 Club writing sprints. We made an announcement about DabbleCon, something that's coming up later this year that you definitely don't want to miss. And lots of live events to keep you motivated, challenged, and informed. Be sure to go to storycraft.cafe to catch up on what's going on and to join in the community and the conversation. We have a great show for you this week with Fiona Barton, but before we get into our great conversation with Fiona, let's hear from best-selling author Mark Sullivan about how stories can find you at the most opportune times. So um, the idea came to me, well, it was delivered to me on the worst day of my life. I, uh, my younger brother and best friend had drunk himself to death. This was in February of 2006. Oh God, I'm so sorry. So oh Matt, had, so Matt sorry. yeah, Matt had died and he was very close. I was very close to him and he died. And then I, I wrote a book that, uh, tanked in the States and you know, we were on the verge of personal bankruptcy and driving to a Costco on a snowy Montana highway, I realized I was worth more dead than alive. And I thought driving into a bridge abutment was a really good idea. Uh, thankfully, images of my wife and son stopped me, but I pulled into that Costco parking lot as rattled as I've ever been. And I put my head on the steering wheel and I begged God and the universe for a story with meaning and purpose. And no kidding, I go home, I'm in no mood to do anything, and my wife forces me to go to a dinner party by myself because we had had to cancel three times on these people. And I go to this dinner party, I don't, I, you know, I know the host, but I don't know the other people, and one of these guys during dinner starts telling me the snippets of this incredible story about a 17-year-old boy in World War II Italy. And I was blown away by the story, and I didn't believe it, though. I mean, I was really skeptical. And then it turned out that the Nazi occupation of Italy and the Catholic underground that formed to save Italy's Jews had never been written about it to a deep extent. And then I learned that Pino Lella, the boy, was alive. So I flew to, I took, you know, some of the last of our dwindling funds, and I I told my wife I was going to go to Italy to chase a 60-year-old war story. And to my wife's great credit, she didn't flinch. She said, well, of course you are. And uh, oh, man. over I went, and I spent, the first time I went, I spent three weeks with Pino. He was 79, and I listened to him on, you know, dig up a story he had buried six decades before. Uh, and, you know, just an incredible story of struggle, triumph, and tragedy that reduced us both to laughter and uh, tears again and again. It was an extraordinary experience for me as a, as a person because listening to Pino, my own problems soon paled. And his insight into life's heartbreak gave me new ins- new perspective on life. And I left uh, Italy three weeks later a changed person. And I vowed to tell Pino Lella's story to as many people as I could. I just didn't think it was going to take me 11 years. Well, thanks for joining me today here in the StoryCraft Cafe. We uh, have the distinct honor today of being joined by Fiona Barton. She has an amazing new book. It's called Local Gone Missing. And I'll tell you what, Fiona, um, I've been thinking a lot about how to um kind of start this conversation but um i i love the book so much because 
it's such a breath of fresh air because it's a it's a callback to mystery stories um, that that I have loved for so long. You know, the 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 in vogue thing are the super fast paced thrillers that that drop you into the story and they kind of go at breakneck speed and characters are all over the place. And uh, and and this is a different kind of story. And and that is not to say um, that that thrillers are better or worse or mysteries are better or it's just different. It's just exactly. different. And, and I love it. I love it. I love that, that we have choice uh, in stories. And so um, anyway, welcome. Uh, welcome to the show. It's good to see you today. Yeah, it's really good to see you, too. Yeah, you're absolutely right, though. You know, what is. What the joy of reading is that choice that, you know, we we can find all sorts of thrillers, mysteries, suspense uh, in amongst. And, and that's, you know, the joy of reading for me, discovering Absolutely. new things. Absolutely. So, Fiona, I've been thinking about some questions lately that that uh, are great conversation starters. And I, and I love this one because <laughs> people have really uh, connected with it. But uh, is there a piece of writing advice? that you have gotten uh, it, either super good and something that really meant the world to you and you've held on to and cling to throughout your writing career, or maybe it's a terrible piece of advice that you look back on and, <laughs> and think, oh, mercy, I'm so glad I didn't um, take that advice. Or, or maybe you did and, you know, have a have an experience from it. Is there anything like that that sticks out to you? Oh, goodness. Um, I got quite a lot of advice. Um, <laughs> As most of us do. Yeah, we do. We do. But um, I think because I had written the book mm -hmm. before anyone else knew um, that I was writing, um, you know, even my husband wasn't aware to begin with. Um, so I just set off on my own. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there were loads of bits of advice, which, you know, don't give up your day job. Nobody makes a living from writing, you know, and, and sort of trying to manage expectations. But, um, you know, people would say only write what you know. And you think, well, yeah, I get that. I get that, you know, if you know a world like, you know, the, the world of journalism that I used in the first three books, it was it was great for me to use that because it, it right. felt like felt like I was coming home. But actually, you know, the whole the whole thing about writing is that you can imagine you can research. Sure. But also you can just put yourself out there and, and, and sit in somebody else's shoes and um, and see things from another perspective. So, well, yeah, you... I, didn't, I didn't follow any advice. really. <laughs> <laughs> we, that advice about only writing what you know, um, that's great until you're a fantasy author or a science fiction author that's writing about the 30th century. Or, I'm not sure Terry Pratchett ever wrote what he knew. <laughs> exactly. Or or a mystery writer who's who's yeah. writing about criminals and, and things that have gone horribly wrong. You know, very few of us know the ins and outs of of cracking a real life mystery you know um, I, I think we would like to think that we are but you know we don't have a lot of experience most of the time no. No. Uh, but yeah that that is you're absolutely right that uh that's that's not very good advice right right what you what you can imagine that's that's a better what piece of advice love. right what inspires you that's the right. thing isn't it it's you know you've got an idea and you think yeah you know i'd love to look into that um and maybe, you know, it's a world that you don't know about, uh, but you can always find out. You can always, you know, write round things and uh, and find people who do know about it. I talk to, you know, people about real life situations all the time to make sure that I get as much right as I can. Right. Exactly. Uh, Fiona, the uh, the new book, um, Local Gone Missing, how many books is this for you now? Uh, that's my fourth book. Um, I started late, <laughs> third career, uh, and I'm writing the fifth one at the moment. So, yeah. Well, I, I love that you started late, as as you say, um, because, you know, that allowed you to to gather up some life experience. Um, and, and this is not to say that people can't write an amazing novel when they're 18, 19, 20. But there is something to be said about writing from the perspective of 
of some life experience to, of meeting lots of varied characters and, um, uh, you know, be living through some things. Um, do, do you ever think about, um, you know, you getting into publishing when you did, as opposed to, you know, what kind of novel that you might've written at, at 25? Do, do you ever think about that? No, to be honest, I don't, because as at 25, as I was a journalist, I was a reporter, a news reporter, and so I I was writing every day, um, other people's words, but <laughs> uh, but was writing every day. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a gap in my life. I loved reading, still do. It's my passion. Um, but no, I don't. I can't imagine what I would have written at 25. And it yeah. was only really, you know, later on that I had the space to do it. Um, you know, when I stopped being a reporter, a journalist, that I thought, I've got, you know, I, I'd like to look at this story. You know, I couldn't just stop dead. Right. So, um, yeah, that's when I started doing it. What's but I love that writing is one of those, is one of the things that uh, people can do at any age. You know, 100%. you can be 80, you can be 17. Um, if you've got a story to tell, it doesn't matter. Right. That's wonderful, isn't it? Right. I, I've met uh, quite a number of novelists who uh, began their careers as journalists or reporters, and I'm fascinated by the the toolkit that you acquire by by doing that job as a journalist or reporter. Um, because it, especially if you live in a, a larger city where there might be multiple news outlets, when when a big news story happens, a big happening. There might be three or four or five or six or seven or eight different people that show up to report on yeah. that event. And and all of the facts are the same, but each of the reporters or journalists see it from their perspective and they report on it a little differently. You'll get a little different details de depending on whose eyes the, the story has come through. Um, do, do you um, draw on that toolkit, so to speak, that uh, – that you acquired as a journalist do, do you absolutely. ever think about that yes absolutely absolutely every day every day um i mean you know sometimes there are a hundred reporters on a story if it's a big one um you know with news crews and and print and online and um and you're right um but that's the different outlets will be looking for a different angle so that people will turn to them to to read it um, or hear it. Um, so, yeah, um, you're always looking for a different way in is, is what we say. Um, yeah. Often, as you say, the, I mean, the facts are the same, right. but you may have found a witness or somebody who was involved and you can tell it from their perspective. And uh, and I love doing that. I really love it. Um, the thing is, I mean, when you're a reporter, every story is different. Um, and every day in a week can be different. And so you get all those different voices. Um, you write it, you tell their story, you move on. But all those voices are still there, you know, ricocheting around my head. Um, you know, whole interviews are so memorable to me and uh, so I've had this brilliant cast of characters to draw on um, and I'm very grateful for that. I love that. Um, speaking of the cast of characters to draw from, um, do you, w when you first think of a story and I'm I'm obsessed with where stories begin and this has been an obsession of mine for years and and I hear uh, as many answers to this question as there are people and everyone is different and and I'm just fascinated that there's no single way that stories uh, come to be uh, you know and uh, I, I like to describe it like this that at one moment a story like local gone missing doesn't exist in any form or fashion it, it just doesn't exist. Uh, mm -hmm. And then either a character walks onto the stage of your mind or uh, and then you're like, who who is this and what are they about? Or or maybe you uh, have read or, or watched a, a news article on, on TV or in the newspaper as if newspapers exist anymore. Um, and and then you start playing the what if game in your mind and mm -hmm. and then you start casting that that story that's beginning, you know, with with these people that don't exist. And then all of a sudden they do exist. And. 
and Loco gone missing in some form or fashion is a thing now. And then as the writer, your job is to dig it out and excavate it and, you know, dust it off and polish it up. And, and then, then there's a whole book there, you know, it's just, it's (laughs) magic. It just, it's just magic. But what is that first moment of inspiration like for you? Um, it, as you say, it just takes so many forms. Sometimes it's a conversation that you hear um, strangers on a train. You could be sitting in the seat behind and you hear a, a conversation and you think, I wonder what's happened there. I wonder what he knows, you know, and you can play games with yourself on right. long journeys. Um, I think with Local Gone Missing, um, it was a, a mishmash of things because um I'd got in my head, um, there's a a quote, isn't there, that uh, I think it might be Tolstoy, actually, somebody terribly um, wonderful writer, saying there are only two plots, the hero's journey or a stranger comes to town. Right. I have it on my wall, in fact. (laughs) Uh, But so I had a I had an experience where um, I was uh, I was in a a bar. It was an event uh, abroad ages ago and uh this guy was stood at the bar and uh no one i knew and he was telling the other people standing around him about his many um very important contacts friends things he knew sure and and, and, and including some royal um contacts and the thing he didn't know was that i used to report on royal news and I knew he was a fake. I knew. Yeah. I mean, he was getting it wrong. <laughs> and um, it lasted minutes. And uh, I think we kind of caught each other's eye. And, uh, and I think he realised that, you know, she knows. Right. Um, and uh, so he moved himself. Off he went. <laughs> but it was afterwards. I sat there thinking, you know, this is somebody who has reinvented himself completely. Right. Um, so what does that feel like? the danger of meeting someone like me while you're you know being this new person and what would you what might you do to uh, protect that story so that kind of started me thinking about you know a stranger somebody coming into a new group of people and um, faking it and uh, the danger of being found out so that kind of started you know the cogs turning and and I was looking for a new character, main character, because uh, my journalist, Kate, Kate Waters, um, you know, she'd had a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a rough ride in the subject. I thought she needed to have a lie down. So um, I was looking at doing something different. And uh, and I I wanted to, to write about a woman who has sort of come to a moment in her life where everything is turned upside down. Um, for various reasons. So I chose to write um, uh, a, a policewoman, uh, a detective, murder detective, who is recovering from breast cancer um, that sort of came out of the blue and uh, and her relationship has gone wrong. Everything has kind of imploded and she's wondering whether she can ever be the detective that she was. So I had the sort of the little, you know, people who fake things, you know, what is that like? What's it like waking up every morning and thinking to yourself, OK, so I'm so and so and 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 I've been and I've done this and I've done that, you know, reminding yourself. Right. Um, living that other life and a detective who is very unsure of her future. So I kind of married them together Um and it developed from there. I mean, it's, you know, that's not the whole story, but it's, right. you know, but that's how it started. Yeah. So when you first developed the character of Elise, um, yeah. were there things that you did to to kind of get in, inside her head? Because the character that you've written previously was a journalist and you you had some insight into kind of how to build that character, because in a lot of ways, um, while she might not have been based on you. Um, she was definitely informed by experiences that you have had. Um, as far as I know, you've never served as a police detective. Um, so, so what what did you do to get 
inside mm-hmm. her head. Um, and 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 by the way, I just have to say this that I love the the um uh the way that the the extra steps that you took to humanize her. Um, not that we like to see anyone going through hardships and you know especially uh, you know cancer and physical hardships like that, but there is something deeper that comes with that character because you took extra steps to humanize her to show us a character that that you know is in one sense the long arm of the law um but is also a, a frail human with her own uh insecurities and all that at the same time and mm. and that's a a tightrope that's difficult to walk sometimes yeah yeah <laughs> you could say that yes i could make it easy for myself so i was starting out with a whole new cast of characters but um i've worked with police during my years as a journalist sure um, I, so I have worked with quite a few but also um I looked and I found um two um really interesting women who are senior detectives and have breast cancer and they've started a charity oh wow so I talked to them about what it is like and they absolutely informed Elise um you know the the fears that people won't take you seriously, that they'll always see you as a sick person. Um, how do you go back to work? All of those things. So I did I did do research. Um, but, you know, and also, you know, just as a woman, um, the whole relationship thing, you know, we've all been there. So, yeah, I, I did use, you know, stuff that I imagined and that I researched and um, kind of, you know, wriggled it all together um <laughs> like you do but thank you very much for saying that that i humanized it because that's what i like to read right. i like characters who've got you know light and shade and um they're not just working machines right um, i like those too you know there are brilliant thrillers where you know you're driven through uh, by the detective but i'm more interested in the people um yeah yeah. You know, what makes people tick? That's what yeah. I like, really. Certain writers that I've met, when they start developing a character, will um, go through uh, all of these different exercises to get to know the character before they start writing. Maybe they'll create character sheets and and they come up with different um, uh, characteristics and um, – different things that make them individual people i'm mm-hmm. i'm i'm at a blank for words for whatever reason oh, I know exactly um, what you mean yeah they'll go yeah. through all sorts of exercises to to learn the character then other writers and i'm a little bit like this that i like to to start writing and and kind of discover who the character is uh while writing a scene you know how would this person um uh, react to this you know and and that sort of thing yeah, yeah and, and that's do, what I do. Do a bit of pre-writing. So are, is is that the camp that you kind it of is, fall in? It is. I'm, I, you know, I do. It's terrible because you get sort of two thirds of the way through and you think, oh, I wonder how tall she is. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> and That's what but, second drafts are for. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was important, actually, how tall she was. But um, no, I don't do big character biogs I don't because as you say things develop and so you don't always need to know how many GCSEs they got or you know what size shoe she takes you don't always need to know that um until later when you know there's a remark by somebody about you know how did you do at school so I like to be a bit looser about them uh, of course, at the end, you've then got to go back and make sure you haven't made terrible errors by saying she was blonde in one bit and dark haired in another. Right. But I don't have photographs that I look at. Some people like to, you know, have a, a face that they can look at. I don't. And um, I think uh, when I did my first book, um, one of the remarks that came back was, I've no idea what Jean looks like. And so I went back and I because I knew in my head I knew sure. but I hadn't written it um so I had to go back and 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 fill in some of that so that, so that the reader would know um what my vision of her was 
I, I've met some people that will cast um, a, a book that they're writing with with actors that that they want to kind of uh, you know use as touchstones or whatever. And uh, invariably, if I do that and and I use Brad Pitt as a character, then I'm I, Brad Pitt. <laughs> then I start thinking about characters that I've seen Brad Pitt play, and I just start writing that character instead of who this. Yeah this made up character is. And I, I think it, it, if you're able to do that and separate those, then God love you. That's, that's amazing. I can't do that. I can't do that either. No, I mean, an actor brings so much baggage with them. I right. know that they can play, you know, a hundred different characters, but you, but there's one that sticks with play. you. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, no, um, I don't do that. In local gone missing, there's another great character, D Eastwood. Um, where did Dee come from and what does she bring to this story? Well, Dee's the cleaner. And uh, so the book is about insiders and outsiders. So right. it's about people, blow-ins, people who arrive in Ebbing, this fictional um, seaside resort, and the people who live there all the time. And Dee, um, so Elise is actually an outsider. She's just moved in. So she's seeing things from an outsider's perspective. Whereas Dee is very much an insider. She's new to the town, fairly new to the town, but right. she knows everybody's business. Um, <laughs> she, you know, she's seen it all. She's seen what medicines you're taking. Um, in a way that, that only, that in a way that only a person who cleans up after other people can. It's it was so uncanny the way that you uh, brought that 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 light and shade to that character. It was amazing when you start thinking about, oh my goodness, there are people that we choose to ignore who know everything. And yeah. it's a little scary. <laughs> it is a little scary when you think because <laughs> yeah. when you think about it. But it's that invisibility that she has because although you know there's a cleaner in the house, you can hear right. her hoovering and things, she doesn't really exist. But she knows so much. I mean, you know, all the letters that you've left out, you know, the 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 phone call she's overheard, all of those things. And I loved that there was somebody who could give a different perspective to what Elise is seeing and what other characters are seeing. Dee is in there and she knows, she knows, but she doesn't tell. That's part of being a good cleaner is that you don't tell. Um, so she and the reader are kind of complicit in that. Um, but it just I wanted to give the reader a different perspective on what was happening behind closed doors. And she was perfect for that. Yes. Yes, she was. Mm -hmm. um, we we started our conversation talking about the difference in um, a direction that a lot of modern uh, novels are taking with the kind of breakneck thriller and, and things are happening, you know, a, a million things a second. And, and the reader is being misdirected here and there. And, you know, you're just worn out at the end of the novel. And I do love some of those. Yeah. Um, but you, you can't just read that all the time. You know, your adrenaline just stays, you know, peaked and, you know, you, you have burnout at some point. Um as opposed to this novel that's more of a classic detective slow burn um mm. it do does does character inform um how um how the story unfolds uh, it, it, I'm, I'm trying to find a, a good way to ask this but does does the the types of characters that you come up with do they determine uh the pace of the story and uh kind of whether this is uh, the frenetic pace versus a more um, uh, smoldering kind of plot, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it does. It does. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. And um, the sort of characters that I have uh, that I've written, they're not breakneck speed characters. So I've got Elise, who's a bit frail. I've got Ronnie, the next door neighbor, who's, you know, the amateur nosy Parker. I've got D. There's there are no car chases. <laughs> that isn't what I write, really, because I like I like to unfold things. I like things to, you know, unfold naturally rather than. And, I, you know, that isn't how I write. Other people do it brilliantly. Right. Um, but it's just not what I'm interested in 
as a writer, I think, you know, I'd much rather, you know, have a bit of uh, a bit of a pause while people are looking into things and, you know, and, and things are occurring to them. Yeah. So it is. Yeah, that's that's the kind of writer I am, I think. I love the way that you put that, that that you allow the reader to take a pause, ponder on things and let realization come to them. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because the the problem with some of the more breakneck speed thrillers is if not done exceptionally well, um, kind of can insult the reader's intelligence in a lot of ways because you're just you're you're just fooling them at, at every turn and uh, mm-hmm. aha you thought it was this but it's really this and mm-hmm. you know, and you can only you can only write gone girl so many times um before it becomes cliche and and some people continue to take that genre and push the boundaries and do amazing oh. things with it and some mm-hmm. people don't and we'll just we'll just put it at that um what do you feel about your relationship with the reader um, and the way that you're telling the story? And do you envision um, that the reader is having an aha moment at certain points? And and do you set up certain things and reveals and scenes to knowing that you're that the reader is going to yeah. take a moment and go, oh, I get it now. You know, that's that's I a, get- Oh yeah, I mean it sounds slightly cynical, doesn't it? But but yeah, <laughs> not really. There are t- there are moments where I get a, an aha moment. You know, I'll be writing and I think, oh right, that's what happened. So yeah, they they happen to me, and I enjoy reading them. Um, but yeah, I I think people got a bit enmeshed in in the twist. Um, you know, there were there was a whole genre where you know it was the twist and you had to have one and right. you know but it's a bit exhausting isn't it it is <laughs> sort of, <laughs> it was for me anyway but no i um yeah i do set things up once it's occurred to me um because it's fun to do that sometimes you know to say uh, and then this happened and you know and people say oh right okay oh I wasn't <laughs> expecting that and that's nice I enjoy that that is fun but yeah there's not a huge you know complete vault fast where everything you thought you knew is turned upside down um no I I, I prefer things to as I say unfold unfold yeah. is more my style rather than twist and you know yeah each to their own, I think. <laughs> Absolutely, and and there's plenty for uh, for everyone to read, no matter what your taste is, and that's absolutely. Well, that's yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, with Local Gone Missing being your fourth book uh, to publish, and you are currently writing your fifth, I think you said. Yes. Um, <laughs> has has your writing pro- process changed from that first novel to where you are now writing your fifth novel? Uh, each one has been so different um, really the first one no one knew I was writing so I just you know pootled along yeah and uh, did a bit here did a bit there put it in a drawer uh, second book uh, I rushed to write because I was terrified um, you know you think I'm never going to be able to do this and there was a deadline from the get-go and all that And so in the second book, I learned that uh, writing is not just putting fingers on a keyboard. You are allowed to think as well. And so I learned a big lesson from that. I rewrote the second 40,000 words of that book. Um, The third book, I really enjoyed writing. And then I went and spoiled it all by (laughs) painting all the characters. So I got really comfortable with the characters that I was using. I loved Kate. I loved Bob Sparks. Um, but it was right to try something different. Um, so, yeah, the local Gone Missing I was was hard. Yeah, it was hard uh, because I had to create this whole world um, from scratch. So the fifth book um, I'm enjoying more because, you know, I've, I've drawn the map. Oh, I, I love it. Of Ebbing. I know Ebbing and, uh, and I know Elise and, you know, so I can enjoy other bits of the writing. So I would say my writing process has kind of lurched left and right. Yeah. And um, 
I don't think anybody ever finds it easy, do they? <laughs> do they find it easy? How many books have you done? Oh, uh, yeah, that, it, it never gets easy. You know, no. uh, after it's, three it's, or four it's novels, you Everest every time. Isn't it? We, you know what? What's interesting is that um, you go through the whole process of finishing a book and then publishing, and then when the next one comes along, every single person is. Uh, uh, is faced with the blank page and it is it is the uh it levels the playing field for everybody everybody starts with nothing and yeah. uh it's it's a gift really yeah jk rowling had mapped out all six of harry potter books was it six um uh, yeah. she had mapped out all of them but uh no i haven't done that well, i haven't <laughs> done that no. we um we talk about world building, um, especially in uh, science fiction and fantasy, where uh, we're talking about creating all new worlds. But um, when you're when you're writing uh, mysteries, and especially with a fictional place like like you've developed, um, mm-hmm. world building is a, a term that we can use. I think that's safe to say because you're 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 a, it's a new place, it's new characters, there are new rules to to this society, if you will. Um, yeah. When you're writing a series and you begin on book two, um, is it easier because of the work that you did in book one, uh, or does the the established world and the 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 rules and the characters does that um, box you in? Uh, do, do you ever think of it in terms like that? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, because the first one you've kind of laid out the ground, right, and you've got different characters that you've put in. Um, that you will want to use again um, and that's great except when you come back to it you think oh god you know she's not old enough to have done this so you are boxed in because you've you've created that world and so you can't just suddenly say oh well never mind we'll, we'll make him 10 years older um, <laughs> it's got to work so yeah um, I hadn't created a world before um, because before place actually wasn't a character I don't think in the first three um but this time it is um ebbing and I didn't want to make it a real place because I think that boxes you in even further you know there's no wriggle room there um and also people then think they're in the book um so (laughs) I'd heard from a friend who did that and it was a bit of a nightmare so I invented it, um, which was a lot of work because um, there's a lot to a town, a lot. Yeah. You, know, you think of the high street and all the rest of it. But uh, yeah, so I did box myself in a bit um, on certain characters. But um, the great thing about it was that I had this place and I, I know it. I can walk down the street in it um, and I know who I'm going to see and right. what sort of people are in which shop and you know that's that's a great help a great right. help i love it um how how long do you see this series going or do, do you have a an ultimate goal for it or are you just enjoying the ride as long as these so. characters are willing to go with you yeah or uh enjoying the ride definitely uh i don't know um i'm i'm contracted to write book five and six Right. Uh, the American uh, publisher for Berkeley. Um, I and I'll see. I'll see. You know how I feel uh, about it. I may, you know, do something completely different again. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Who knows? Well, I love it. Um, Local Gone Missing is on sale June fourteenth uh, here in the states, and um, I, I love it. Go visit your local bookstore and support local books, or or grab it on Amazon. Um, at, the um, how do you feel about your books being translated into audiobook? Uh, you know, audio is is a huge growth market right now, and uh, yeah. people are are loving you know being able to pop in their earbuds and and join a book when they're you know standing in line somewhere or whatever. Um, yeah. have, do you listen to your audio books? It's a little weird sometimes to listen to your yeah. own book, but what do you think about it? Well, they've been done brilliantly. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled with them but it is weird the first one the widow um i knew jean's voice you know i could hear her in my head all the way through writing it and then suddenly an actress uh was speaking her and that was really you know oh that's not jean 
but it was. Um, she did it brilliantly. Uh, I just had to kind of, you know, hand her over. Yeah. Because the reader would have a different voice. Every single reader would would hear her differently um, when they're reading the book. But um, no, I like the audio books very much. It's very accessible. And it's huge here as well, the market. You know, that's what people are doing. Rather than e-readers, in fact, it's audio books. And I listen to them all the time. I do too. I do too. Yeah. Uh, Fiona, we wish you much success on the new book launch. And uh, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it.